Professor Colin, um, who has a rich um, background in Chinese um, corporations, law, and culture. Um, he is also of uh, Chinese corporate ecosystem. Uh, his academic journey has has led him to attend LLB and a, a PhD in Chinese study from UBC. That's a university of British Columbia. British Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so along with the Bachelor <coughs> Honours from mm. Doha University in the UK. Okay, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, I think uh, to understand the way that Chinese companies interact with the Chinese government when they go overseas, we need to also or first understand how they interact with the government in China. So that's my focus is on the Chinese corporate and political ecosystem within China. Um, and there's a difference between what people see as the surface and the reality so if you look at this, um, looks like a landscape painting, <coughs> but when you go in closer, you find it's made up of <coughs> thousands and thousands of individual people with their own, you can imagine they have their own needs, desires, and interests, right? And uh, in some ways, the Chinese government is a bit like that. We have this surface view that it's a pyramid uh, where the Communist Party is in control and Xi Jinping is at the top, and not just controlling the whole party, the government, but also um, all sorts of institutions in China, whether it's um, police, courts, state-owned enterprises, universities, etc., or even private corporations through Communist Party branches, that the assumption is that the Chinese Communist Party can control all those institutions. But the reality which, when you look more closely at how people behave in China, is that there are many dynamic forces that prevent that kind of control, especially corruption and guanxi, which is relationship networks and self-interest of all the actors involved. And that often subverts that pyramid of control, the central Communist Party control. So <coughs> I prefer to uh, use the terms fragmented or decentralized authoritarianism, which has been, many scholars have used those terms, um, and describe this ecosystem as dynamic, frequently chaotic maelstrom of complex corporate political networks that subvert, frequently subvert the government and the party at every level. So it's more like the diagram of the yin yang, right? Um, where you, but you imagine there's, these are many different forces interacting together, swirling around, and influence comes from many different directions. So it's not necessarily a, a pyramid, a simple pyramid of control. So I just want to illustrate that with three very brief case studies uh, drawn from my recent book. And uh, the first one is about the CEFC group. And this was a private firm founded by Ye Jianming, and they started buying up petrochemicals and oil overseas and importing them to China. Oh, sorry, yeah, there, yeah. Um, <coughs> and uh, they also started buying up financial services companies as well. They had this extremely rapid expansion from 2007, and they managed to get into the top, the global Fortune Top 500 corporations. Um, in 2015, they invested heavily in the Czech Republic, over one billion US dollars, and that allowed Ye Jianming to become a special advisor to the Czech president. In 2016, they bought up an African oil field. And then the thing that really grabbed people's attention was this 9.1 billion US dollar bid for 14% of Rosneft, the largest Russian oil firm in 2017. So <coughs> overseas commentators assumed that this company could not have grown so fast without central Communist Party support, and that it must be some kind of front for the CCP's Belt and Road plans, uh, its infiltration of Europe and Africa, even though it was te technically looked like a private corporation. They thought Ye Jianming must somehow be related to one of the CCP princelings, like Marshal Ye Jianying, because his name was very similar. 
although actually it wasn't related to him. And there are photos of Ye with Xi Jinping, which seem to confirm this. <coughs> but um, this is one of those photos, and um, Ye Jinping is on the left there. And the reason he's there is because he's actually a special advisor to the Czech president, having you know put in so much money to Czech Republic. And he's basically there as, as supporting the Czech president when he visited China on a state visit. <coughs> and in fact, the whole reality of this company is quite different from the uh, surface. And in fact, they had this very sudden reversal in 2017. It turned out that this was basically a very corrupt scheme that they were running, whereby the uh, uh, Ye Jianming got the support of Wang Sanyun, a provincial party secretary, and uh, by, by giving an apartment to his son in Shanghai. <laughs> and uh, Wang introduced him to Hu Huaibang, who, who was, became the party secretary of China Development Bank. And then through that, and through various bribes, uh, he was able to access state bank financing for projects which normally should not have qualified for that. It wasn't supposed to be development financing, but because of this corrupt scheme, they were working together. Uh, he was able to access all that money to buy up all those companies overseas and trying to profit himself and his cronies. And um, it even involved a former civil affairs minister of Hong Kong called Patrick Ho, who was helping them with some of their contacts overseas in Africa. And so all of these people were actually arrested either in China or overseas because of their corruption. And uh, they are either in jail or still detained or some of them have finished their jail sentence. But um, you could see that there were links between this company and I didn't mention the military, some military links as well and government links but those people within the official circles were not acting for China's interest. They were acting in their own self-interest. And uh, it was dressed up as national interests such as, oh, this is for our China's energy security, or this is the Belt and Road thing. But actually, it was not. Um, it didn't have any political, military, or economic benefit to China. And in fact, it left the state banks with tens of billions of dollars of unpaid debts. Uh, because it was pretty much like a, almost like a pyramid scheme. Yeah? So we need to think twice before we characterize that a private firm coming overseas from China is somehow doing the Communist Party's business or under the Communist Party's control. Often it's not like that at all. Uh, but <coughs> what about state-owned enterprises? Um, sorry, I keep got to keep doing the, yeah, okay. State-owned enterprises, you'd expect the Chinese government would have more control over those kind of companies, right? I want to focus on the coal and power state-owned enterprises in China. But when you look at them, you find they had this huge expansion of building coal-fired power stations since 2005, and uh, it carried on in several waves. It especially peaked around 2015 when um, local governments were given the approval power for these coal-fired power stations instead of having to go up to the central government. But th even before that, there were hundreds uh, that were constructed illegally by these power state-owned enterprises. And it wasn't rational because it led to this massive inefficiency. Um, sorry, yep. <coughs> it led to massive inefficiency. So only about 50% of the capacity of these power stations is being used today. Uh, they're just not needed, a lot of them. And it also led to huge state-owned enterprise debts. So it seems to be kind of an ir irrational way of doing business. And they're going against central government restrictions as well. So why and how did that happen? It's because of these tripartite relationships uh, between local governments in China, central regulators who are paid off to turn a blind eye to the fact that these are not supposed to be approved, um, these power stations, and state-owned enterprise executives who are keen to expand their companies to make them bigger because that was one of their main targets for promotions and, and things like that. And also, both the state-owned enterprises and the local governments were able to give contracts to you know, subcontractors who were either their friends, families, 
um, so that they could benefit from this personally. And they worked together to either influence central regulations to make them more lax, to put in exemptions, or to ignore them, to turn a blind eye to the fact that these um, power stations should not have been built. So the Central Communist Party is, is really not being able to control this. Okay, And um, it's not just in the power industry. It's also Chinese economists have found that uh, at least 6.9 trillion US dollars worth was wasted on ineffective investment in domestic in infrastructure between 2009 to 2013. It led to overcapacity in numerous state-sponsored industry sectors and massive local government and state-owned enterprise debts, um, and also worsening emissions and pollution. So <coughs> it doesn't really seem to be part of a Communist Party grand strategy to allow this kind of thing to happen. It's much more haphazard and much more based on the local interest and the self-interest of these actors. So if, this, if the Central Communist Party can't control state-owned enterprises in China, it's even less likely to be able to manage that overseas, right? Um, the, th the third case study I called Huawei and the PRC National Intelligence Law. Um, you might have heard quite a few quotations like this in the media. Huawei would be forced to hand over 5G data to the Chinese government if it was asked for it because of China's national intelligence law from 2017, which requires organizations and citizens to support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work. And you see similar quotations about TikTok more recently <coughs> for the same reason. But why was the national intelligence law actually introduced in 2017? It's another example of the internal fragmentation of the Chinese political system. Um, you may have heard that there was, in 2011 to 12, there was an attempted coup in China by Zhou Yongkang, who was in the Politburo Standing Committee, and Bo Xilai, who was in the Politburo and one of the Chongqing Party Secretary. Um, it didn't succeed, but when they started investigating what led up to this, and they found that the China's domestic state security system was heavily implicated in this, or parts of it, and... Um, that includes basically China's intelligence agencies, right? And uh, so 2011 to 2013, there was quite a bit of unauthorized bugging of Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, Xi Jinping, et cetera, by the state security agents working with Zhou and Bo to try and find incriminating information about them. Uh, so that led to uh, many of these senior state security ministers being dismissed. Uh, uh, some of them were jailed, like Ma Jian, jailed for life in 2015 for corruption, misusing state secrets, subverting the Communist Party involvement in this plot. S and and it, they found that there was, you know, it was riddled with corrupt agents in the intelligence agencies and foreign moles, and there was a massive purge of the state security agencies from 2014 onwards. And that's when the, both the state security ministry and the Chinese government started really saying, W these agencies need to follow the law. They need to comply with the law because they've been ev evading it and causing a huge amount of trouble for the Communist Party. So that's when they came in with the anti-espionage law in 2014 and the intelligence law, in intelligence law came in in 2017. <coughs> so you can see that actually there's a lot of um, corruption, guanxi self-interest going on even within the state security ministry. So the PRC National Intelligence Law, what did it actually change in 2017? Its aim was to regain control over these rogue state security agents, and it actually limits their previous powers compared to the 1993 National Security Law, which was a previous version. And uh, it didn't add any new requirements for citizens and organizations to support intelligence work because they were already in the 1993 law. But what it did do is remove a power to inspect organizational and personal electronic communication tools and other equipment and facilities, which was in the previous law, removed. And then they added internal compliance procedures to ensure that agents followed the law. And they strengthened complaints and redress procedures when agents abused their powers or act for s acted for selfish gain. 
So all those things were new and they basically restricted the powers that the agencies had before. But overseas commentators have completely ignored this context of the internal chaos and fragmentation that led to this law, and instead they've assumed that this law was somehow a new thing, a grand strategy to gain control over the data of private Chinese firms. But there's no evidence that that law was introduced for that purpose. Now, even if, <coughs> okay, uh, so this might make us maybe question the narrative about companies like Huawei and the national intelligence law. There might be an alternative way of looking at this. Okay, uh, uh, two minutes maybe, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <coughs> so you may know that Huawei is a telecom and internet hardware producer, a private company owned by its employees. It benefited from the massive expansion of telecom and internet works in China, uh, networks in China and overseas. Uh, from basically no mobile phones and no internet in many of these countries to billions of users. So it was able to build a lot of those networks. <coughs> now, even if we assume that the intelligence agencies could ask or demand Huawei provide access to its networks for some kind of you know, intelligence purposes overseas, uh, we need to look at this from the point of view of competing interests within the Chinese government. And and when we look at the evidence, you might have a slightly different conclusion, depending on how you, you know, on your views, I guess. But the first is, there's no evidence that Huawei's networks have been compromised. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a potential threat rather than an actual threat. Um, Kieran Martin of the UK's National Cyber Security Center at G uh, GCHQ, he's, he concluded that any risks of having Huawei in the UK's 5G networks could be controlled, and so it's just like any other vendor, right? Um, secondly, backdoors, putting backdoors into their networks is not in Huawei's or the Chinese government's interest. This is because of the, the dependency of Huawei on the international markets and international suppliers of some of its key components. So if backdoors are discovered in Huawei's equipment overseas, uh, the sanctions would cripple Huawei, their business would be finished, and uh, Huawei has about 50% of the 5G market in China, and also another ZTE, another Chinese firm similar to Huawei, has 30% has of the 5G market in China. So it would basically mean that the PRC government would have to rely on foreign suppliers if, if, they can't, if Huawei and those ZTE can't exist anymore, right? <coughs> so there's no incentive for doing that as far as the Chinese government is concerned to threaten Huawei's business in that way. There's no evidence that banning Huawei will actually protect our own cyberspace or networks because Chinese and other ac actors cyber hacking has been very successful already even without needing to use any Huawei equipment in many countries. And there are reasons for that I don't have time to get into but uh, uh, the, the potential threat test, which is being used at the moment by the US against Huawei, um, it goes against the rule of law because it's a guilt by association. It's, it's saying even though you haven't done anything against our national security, there's a potential you might do it because you're a Chinese company, and therefore we're going to try and ban you. It's not really following the rule of law. Uh, it's saying it's guilt by association, right? Finally, there's no clear economic or political objectives of, of these sanctions. I don't think the US government has thought through whether this will actually lead to a more democratic China or protection of human rights in China, um, or actually it will lead to increased tension and more conflict as China becomes more desperate because its economy is being threatened. So in conclusion, the relevance for Australia and other countries, the Central Communist Party, oh, have I been not doing the, yeah, yeah, sorry, that was the thing about Huawei's, um, yeah. In conclusion, <coughs> uh, the Central Chinese Communist Party is much weaker than it appears on the surface. Uh, it's engaged in this futile struggle to keep control over its own society and its own uh, party members, right? We shouldn't always blame the central government in Beijing um, 
for things that go wrong with Chinese corporations overseas. We should pay attention to individual, local, corporate self-interests, and not, it's not necessarily the interest of the Chinese government. We should also modify our views of some Chinese corporations overseas if they're acting mainly for commercial reasons, um, and that would help to reduce international tensions rather than assuming that every Chinese company that comes overseas is somehow trying to subvert uh, our own Western society. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks. Our final presenter is Professor Yun Kun from the College of International Studies at Kun He University. Um, she has held esteemed positions such as visiting scholar at the Harvard University and uh, visiting scholar at the University of Hawaii, supported by uh, POSCO scholarship. Yeah. Yes, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. My project is just really preliminary stage, so I would really welcome your feedback and comment. So, so my research is try to look at Chinese regulatory structure or institution about overseas, the business of overseas uh, investment from central SOE. So I have some kind of previous research and knowledge about Chinese regulatory system and structure about domestic business. So I try to look at these kind of system and institutions still also can be applied in overseas investment or not, and, and try to understand what kind of regulatory structure about overseas industry. So happen to, I'm not expert about Indonesia, but um, I try to look at where is the largest overseas investment in Southeast Asia, particularly the, the focus of BRI, and I find it is Indonesia. This is why I look at Indonesia as a case. This is probably you know very well. Chinese overseas investment exploded since early 2000 and up to more accelerated since BRI. So it's Zhou Chiju and then it's more reading source of development, uh, financing in developing country. However, as we know, the losing state asset, particularly since 2016, 17, even more. I'm going to show the graph. So after this losing a lot of loss of state asset, Chinese authority um, tried to make new rule and new kind of regulation, which is like guideline on further guiding and regulating overseas investment is from State Council 2017. So you can see overseas investment dropping out since 2017, even dropping during COVID-19. So I'm, I'm going to want to show, this is the green line is the amount of the investment money, and then blue line is the number of overseas investment, invested state-owned enterprise. And then the event is the red line. So the basically it's dropping. And after 2017, new regulation even more dropping. So this is kind of trend. I'm sorry, it is too small word. <laughs> so I took it from Chinese reference. There are some major large scale overseas state asset loss, Macau steel, Sino steel, all these kinds. Of. So basically all happening uh, after going out, uh, late 2000, early 2010, something like. So I can, I can share if you request later. And this is afterward 2017, there are some kind of risk assessment, managing. Um, this is the total number of SOE, particularly central Soyang uh, and it's decreasing, as you know. But this is the rising, the number of state-owned enterprise under audit from the audit office. And they find some kind of problem and kind of amount of disclosed and problematic money so just want to show the, the trend. There are more scrutiny and investigation. So, so far, I find that there are two large group of existing study. The first group, 
most of the study is looking at whether Chinese state-owned enterprise overseas investment driven by strategic goal or profit-seeking as commercial actor. So we also see a lot of some debate. Is it state-owned enterprise? Is they are listening to state or they are just profit-seeking commercial actor? Another body of literature is about whether Chinese overseas state-owned enterprise are risk covers or risk taking when Chinese party state measure we see their strategic value or not. So there are two large body of literature about overseas investment. However, in spite of a lot of Im importance losing state asset, the regulatory mechanism about overseas investment still remain understudy, which is, I think, it's be because it's difficult. We, do, we don't know this, what's going on inside, who has real power, who has more influence or not. So this is what I have interest in, try to look at. So this study tried to fill this gap by more focusing on Chinese central SOE's overseas investment in Indonesia, what is the regulatory mechanism, and who has real kind of authority to monitor, supervise, and all these kind of things. I'm going to explain later quickly why Indonesia in a minute. So, so far what I found is very backward institutional structure for regulation about overseas business. What's the current status? Very fragmented, as expected, and overlapped. Fagawe, Guozue, and Ministry of Commerce, they overlap. So inconsistent, they have some bureaucratic rival contest competition. So because of this overlapped authority, very inconsistent rule. Rule is not consistent from different authority because different department, they have different interests to defend. So the outcome is very inefficient regulation. Another characteristic I so far I found is very focused on afterward regulation. What does it really mean? Like, you already lost your state asset, and then try to find out what is the corruption, punishment. This is very much afterward regulation, not risk management or risk managing some kind of regulation. Or, so it means that so China has some two step, two step. First step is pre-regulation. Pre-regulation meaning that I'm going to show later. Um, there are some Fagawe, Guozue, and Minister of Commerce. You have some kind of authority to approve. Um, uh, what kind of, what? Beiyan, Pijun, all these kind of process. And there are post-regulation, already lost state asset, and then Guozue and Audit Office and Central Discipline Inspection Commission, they investigate. Who has the problem? Is there any kind of criminal crime or what, what's the happening? So I have interest in this kind of lack of investment supervision or regulation in the middle of the implementing project. In the middle of the project, there is missing some regulatory, some kind of mechanism. So this is also from Chinese reference. sensitive project or non-sensitive, and then who has, but it's very <coughs> overlapped. So Fagawe, as you know, Fagawe and NDRC and Minister of Commerce, they have a different interest. NDRC, you really want to develop national economy, right, and industrial policy. But Minister of Commerce, you care about foreign trade, international trade, affair, you, you really comply with international trade rule and everything. So sometimes they, c they cannot agree each other. So that also end up with more inefficient regulation. So this is my very bold <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> and I try to, I hypothesize maybe Chinese development bank, Kai, uh, Kai Hang, is maybe they are not just giving the money or funder. They also play very important role as a regulator. Why? Then let me explain this. Because this 
Chinese Development Bank as a shareholding state corporation. So you have to listen to state authority because you are a policy bank. But at the same time, you're a bank. You have responsibility to raise the value, state asset, right? So profit also very important concern. So they are able to refuse the loan from far away. But for example, state top reader, they sign the Chinese invest important some official, um, some kind of some kind of responsibility or uh, obligation from Xi Jinping or go to Indonesia and they may, they, they sign. However, um, in the process, Central uh, Chinese Development Bank, they can they may suspend. I'm sorry because this is a little bit risky and there is no enough profit maybe we can expect. So that let me hold on this project. They suspend. This is what happened the most famous project, High Speed Railway, five or six years suspended because of their land issue, many kind of resistance. So this Chinese developed bank, they have some kind of, it seems to me they have some kind of authority to <laughs> control or even manage the risk, right? So this is the, what I think is a very interesting case. So my question is, how to regulate the business of Chinese overseas investment? Here, regulating meaning that securing or raising the value of status. I think that's maybe Kaihang. So conducting extensive, uh, what, how can they regulate? Because they're able to, they do a lot of extensive appraisal study, feasible study since the very famous Chen Yuan, the, the retired the principal president of CDB, they have many, many, many staff. They dispatch a lot of country, and they actually do a lot of study, local, Indonesia, or Sri Lanka, and everywhere, even like where, in some, some kind of Africa or Latin America. They all go, and they look at the local situation. Is it really profitable or not? So they really manage the risk. This is the CDB. And they carefully monitor implementation of a commitment. So commitment, land issue shouldn't be really released and solved out, but Indonesia was not really successful about that. So we're gonna hold on, giving the money. So suspending when the potential risks are found, even after signing the project. And I think this is the role of regulator and supervisor to protect the value of the state asset. That this is the case why I look at Indonesia. The first is the largest overseas investment in Southeast Asia, and Indonesia is the key player in BRI. So it's important, it's very important for China. Then I look at the cases, is there are 150 cases, overseas investment, um, central SOE, the largest one. There are also private, uh, local, and there is some sectoral distribution, of course, as we expected, energy is the largest part of Indonesia. Oh, the data is coming from Heritage Foundation because it's the massive database. And this is also very interesting. <laughs> According to Heritage Foundation, there are failed cases, failed investment. There are six failed cases, all of them central SOE. And these are six failed cases according to Heritage Foundation. But what is the most important, I think, is the Chinese developed bank are not involved in any of these failed cases. So they are very careful. So I'm going to look at uh, this Batam project, so-called uh, PT West Point Terminal Oil Storage is from the Sinopec. They declare we are not going to do it anymore. It signed 2012. But suspended until 2015 and now dropping out. It's failed cases and I'm, there is no, no engagement of CDB. So I try to look at what happened, what was the process. And another uh, high speed rail project is so far is the most successful overseas investment in Indonesia. So, and there is, there is CDB role and I think, and try to compare why CDB is not involved in these troubled cases and what kind of contribution or risk management in this high speed railway project. So this is so far I have. I welcome your comment. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Yukum's um, illuminating uh, presentation. So now we have um, Professor Lee uh, to discuss it. Thank you. All right. Um, very interesting uh, presentations. I, I learned uh, a great deal. Um, so I just uh, give comments in the order as um, the presentation. So first, uh, Colin. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I totally agree. Uh, this is uh, also I'm working on a project uh, looking at how China interact with international legal order. And my approach is that you know we, we have to look, unpack the state, look at different factions, look at different stakeholders. So I totally agree. I am glad you bring this uh, approach to the study of the Chinese corporate ecosystem. Um, and I, my comment to you is, uh, you know, the comment I got from from uh, colleagues who who uh, um, you know critiqued my my work, you know, how far do we go when we unpack the the state, right? Uh, you know, now we recognize it's fragmented. Then how to what extent is is fragmented? Do we go to the individual level? Right, I mean, it seems that uh, part of your presentation suggests we should look at the individual actor's interest, personal interest, but uh, that's just too complex, right? Or is there is there an optimal point where uh, the unit of analysis is uh, fragmented, but this does not fall to the lower to, to the macro individual level, so that it's, it's, it's more manageable, right? The, 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 the analysis will be more uh, manageable. And um, so, yeah, so I, I guess that's the, that's the um, and um, so undergirding your uh, uh, arguments is the agency problem, right? The principal agency problem. The principal is the, 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 uh, the surface, uh, Xi Jinping, right? And, and the core party, uh, CCP. Uh, but the agents could be anyone, right? Uh, so I, I, I guess in your paper, you must have emphasized it. But here, I guess, from time in your presentation, it's in the background, but I, I, I think it would be helpful to bring it to, to the forefront um, so that uh, people will immediately understand the importance of your work, right? It's just the, uh, stressing the agency issue across the, all the study, all the research about the, the Chinese uh, uh, state. Um, and Wen Ting, um, also, also very, uh, very interesting um, uh, and timely work, right? Uh, the international, internationalization of Chinese currencies is this uh, very, very important topic. Everyone's interested. Um, so, but um, I, I guess um, you're missing a very important aspect of it, uh, the geopolitical uh, context, right? Uh, uh, to what extent, China is trying to promote uh, internationalization of RMB uh, as a result of the uh, the geopolitical environment, right? Changes, or shifts in, in the geopolitical context. Mm -hmm. So that's I think that's something we, we uh, I guess most people will uh, want to learn more about, right? So. Um, and you also said uh, uh, the, uh, you, you give us a, a clear uh, uh, role of the Chinese state. So I, I would actually situate your presentation uh, <laughs> in, in, in a broader debate about fragmented uh, state, right? Uh, is China, you're treating China as a rational actor with a clearly defined goal here. And, uh, but but uh, if we take the fragmented authoritarian state uh, approach seriously, uh, then question follows, right? Uh, where does the goal come from? And uh, uh, who defines the goal, right? Uh, wh uh, wh to whom does the goal serve, right? Uh, whose interest does the goal serve, right? Um, and how, how, if there is in the, uh, a clear goal, uh, how did it evolve uh, in the past? And how, where is it going, right? So if you look at China's uh, uh, currency policies, it changed over time, right? In, in the 1990s, right? Uh, I, I still remember before the Asian financial crisis, uh, 
the, the, the central government is very clear. We have a, 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 a agenda, a clear agenda. We'll liberalize capital market. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring China in, into the global eco economic order. We totally buy into the you know, free capital market uh, ideology. But then the financial, Asian financial crisis hit. And suddenly, the, the, the central government started to take a very conservative approach. And so, so it evolves, and the, the, the China's policy evolved as a response to the international context. So I, I would like to first, uh, I would like to uh, urge you to, to, to do two things. One, uh, unpack the state. I don't think the policy goal reflects a rational actor's clearly defined interest. And second, uh, try to bring China's international context into the picture. Right, and to what extent the policy goal evolves as a response to the international context. So that, that's the, those are the two, uh, 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 I think two ways, uh, uh, two means you, in, in which you could uh, uh, improve this, th this project. All right, and uh, last, uh, Yongqing. Uh, very, very interesting, as I mentioned, I, I, I think this is uh, a project with great potential. I mean, China Development Bank has uh, played such an important role in China's uh, global expansion. And China's actually economic development itself, right? Uh, the, the, the Development Bank is a key actor, uh, but it's understudied. The, the institution itself is understudied. So if you, you could, um, you know, do interviews. You know, look at, the, you know, find all the archive, archival uh, evidence, and, and uh, present us with a, you know, clear idea, um, analytical framework about how this, the role of the institution, how the role involved, uh, how how is the role defined within the uh, the, uh, the broader. Uh, uh, state uh, capitalism of China. That would be great, that would be great. And um, another, uh, you, you mentioned that, um, you, you, well, not part of your presentation, but uh, you know, the, sort of during our conversation, you said, you know, that the, we should follow the cash, follow the money, right? Uh, and the development bank has the money, so we should look at it um, in order to understand Chinese overseas investment. But another major uh, m means uh, through which a, s a state supervise Chinese overseas investment is through the personnel management system, right? Uh, uh, I, I think, so, so for Chinese SOEs, there are two means. One is 人, 管, 管人, one is 管钱. And so you, you focus on 管钱, but I think 管人 is even more important, especially for the SOEs. Um, so that's something I, I, I urge you to explore a little more, uh, a little more, and try to bring that into into your analysis. But overall, I, I really enjoyed those three presentations, and uh, looking forward to to your publications. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just quickly respond to that question about the how far do we go to unpack the state, and whether it should go down to the individual level. I tend to go down to the level of a corporation. Um, but it's interesting, it depends, even the kind of foreign governments, when they look at some of these Chinese corporations, they sometimes go down to the individual level, like looking at Huawei, they say, oh, Rin Zhengfei used to be in the Chinese military, even though after he left the military, it was four years until he set up Huawei as a very small, tiny company. <coughs> Somehow that he's still connected to the military for the rest of his life. Um, so, they, so the foreign governments sometimes do use that even at the individual level of, of the people running these companies to try and create some evidence that they are connected to the state or the military. Um, <coughs> so we can't really ignore that level when it's been actually raised by the foreign governments when they're deciding whether to put sanctions on a company. Um, but generally speaking, I would say you, you need to look at the corporation and it's its ownership, its relations with the actual relations with government entities in China and um, what the motivations of those different groups are. And if you can find a pretty rational argument that makes more sense than a more of a conspiratorial speculative one, then I think you should focus on that rather than creating things out of air, you know, 
which I think a lot of foreign commentators do. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the comments. Very useful. Uh, just a very brief response. Um, a first um, comment about the uh, inclusion of the geopolitical environment. So it's my fault that not including the theoretical framework of this paper to the presentation. So my sense about the geopolitical um, environment is more like it's more like structuralist perspective and saying that the state interests are defined by the given geographic or the international structures but because i'm more like constructivist i would think that the um, geopolitical environment is more like a discursive contact for the chinese um, actors, but it's more like what is what kind of the ideas dominant in the Chinese society like can define the China's currency policy interests. So certainly, I think it's a very good point that I should include more like the geopolitical context as a discursive environment that shaped the Chinese policymaker thoughts. Uh, about the state as a unitary actor, not looking to the domestic actors, very useful insights. That's the reason why I come to this conference, because I'd like to learn more about the how the uh, colleagues think about the Chinese company's role. I'm very keen to research on the Chinese policy uh, companies, the private sector's role, the domestic roles in um, shaping the China's um, currency policy making. And actually, the finance area is a very interesting same field where the intellectuals plays a very significant role. So usually the people can comment on the trade. We know that the um, the deficit, the supplies, um, people know about their um, politics, and everybody comment on that. But uh, when it relating to the finance, we usually think about the mathematics guy. The complicated finance theory will leave to the central bankers. Uh, so that's the reason why the monetary policy making usually influenced by the economic theories dominant in the free world. We see like in the last centuries how the Keynesianism dominated other Western uh, macroeconomic schools training and then the neoclassical economics get back and then we have the global financial crisis with see the Keynesianism come back and we have the macro prudential uh, regulations, we see that like, neoclassical economics does wor not work now. So that's the reason why I emphasize the economic ideas a lot, the assumptions between the state and market relations, because this is the different beliefs on the importance of the state intervention, intervention or the um, market's invisible hands that shaped our thoughts, our interest in the monetary policy making. So yeah, and I like your point about the Asian financial role. Indeed, before Asian financial crisis, um, it reshapes the China's understanding of the state um, market relations. And I believe also uh, reshaped the understanding uh, of the many other Asian neighboring thoughts about the IMF and the Washington consensus that like before the Asian financial crisis, every, uh, the most Asian countries would like to liberalize their capital accounts. But after that, they think, no, we think the market is not rational. The, when we need the capital account controls to um, stabilize the economy. So we can't go with the rapid capital account liberalization just as what the IMF suggests. suggests. We need to cautiously precede this liberalization. So this is not the IMF and US wanted. This is not the neoclassical economics suggest. But the, like the China and the Malaysia, they got the capital account controls just contradictory contrary to the IMF suggests, and they survived the Asian financial crisis. So they, their understanding about the market-state relations totally reshaped after that crisis. So very interesting point, and thank you for the comments. Uh, thank you for the comment. I just, so you, you talk about, I have to, it's better to look at also personal management. So that means the central SOE personnel? Personnel. Personnel, right. yeah. Yeah. But, uh, when you have uh, SOE, top SOE yeah. officials, 
SASAC group play a role, right? The SASAC yeah. review, annual review yeah. of the senior management, if they mm. want to come up for, mm. for promotion, will be reviewed by SASAC. Yeah. Of course, also internal review, mm. and then SASAC. So, um, uh, and yeah, so, so th definitely, uh, it, I guess for SOEs, right? SOE uh, executives, uh, um, they, they get paid. Uh, yeah, so of course, they care about their income. <laughs> But I, I know that um, it's important, this personnel management. But if you look at these failed cases, all of them, Central Zhongyang Chie, they are all managed by Zhongzubu and Sasa. But they still fail, right? So that, that the point is the personnel management, maybe it's one of the means, but it's, it cannot prevent the losing the state asset. So this is why. Because I just hypothesize, I'm not sure Central Development Bank is really has some kind of law to prevent any kind of losing state debt. But um, yeah, so, um, I think money is more important. Well, it, is, uh, it depends on your, your threshold, right? So, so if you're administrator, SOE investment in, in, in overseas uh, should not fail, then I, I don't think that's realistic. So mm -hmm. uh, what's your benchmark? No, 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 but Chinese, Chinese development bank are not embarked. Right, but so uh, that maybe they suspend some. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Oh, man. If you come home, yeah, why don't you ask the questions? <laughs> very yeah. interesting conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting conversation. Um, yes, we move on to Q&A. We we'll start from this role. Yes, please. Um, so we need to. Session. Um, wonderful. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. I, I have questions for all of you, um, sadly, but um, but that's good. No one gets left out. Um, Colin, I absolutely agree with your main argument. My concern is in a case study approach, the accusation you might face from your um, reviewers is you're cherry picking cases because I can pick three companies to back up the, al the alternative argument and I can pick another three in the Pacific to absolutely back your argument. Um, so an example from the Pacific, in the MC MCC, which China Metallurgical Group, which is the first company I looked at in detail there, um, when you talk to them in sort of 2010 or so about SASAC regulating them, they literally laughed in your face. They thought it was the silliest thing to imagine that SASAC could have any power or influence over them at all. Um, roll on five years later and SASAC has placed MCC under the control of China Min Metals, even though it's a top 30 or top 40 company, they put them under the control of China Mid Metals because of a string of failed investments. And this is a company that five years previously was like laughing at the idea of, well, the state can't, can't hold us back, we just do what we want. And they literally were doing what they wanted, um, including the Sino Iron, which got a, a shout out on, on Yuk Yung's um, slide. And if you talk to these companies year after year, so you pick a company and you talk to them year after year, all the ones in the Pacific, depending on their ownership structure, and this is the key thing, um, will say to you, yeah, we're facing a lot more pressure to tow the line, to carry the state's water than we used to under Hu Jintao Wen Jiaobao. What really makes a difference is the ownership structure. So say if you um, look at some of the companies in the Pacific, they're completely decentralised. So essentially their only mission is to make money and send it back to headquarters. So they can kind of get away from the political stuff. But if you're CCECC South Pacific, a wholly owned subsidiary of the parent company with not even any shareholders to answer to, when the state comes knocking on your door and says, can you lobby Solomon Islands to switch from Taiwan to China, you don't knock them back, you go and do it. Um, if you want to do some 
vaccine diplomacy. You go and do it. There's no real scope for you to, to push back, even though you know being seen as a geopolitical actor hurts you commercially. You, you can't do much about it. And the Guanrin point, a fantastic point. Um, there's a really good article in Journal of Contemporary China, which you may have seen last year, looking at national oil companies and appointments made to the senior appointments made to the Knox overseas um, that essentially, it was based on a really impressive source, so 70 interviews or so with leading executives saying, yes, party loyalty is now being you know, chosen ahead of technical expertise and we're really worried about it. Um, on the Huawei thing, so maybe a longitudinal approach, I don't know if you can work that into your paper, would, that would allow you to escape the accusation that you're cherry picking. Um, and on the Huawei thing, I absolutely agree it's not in Huawei's interest to be seen to be handing over data. Um, you know, just as Facebook doesn't hand over data to law enforcement agencies, even in America, um, even if it's a clear-cut criminal case involving, you know, child sex abuse and so forth, they will still resist handing over the data just because that's their business model. But I guess in question one, how would we see it if they handed over the data? It's in neither party's interest to say, oh, yeah, we just handed over your data to the Chinese government and Chinese government's not going to turn around and say, yeah, we got it from Huawei. But point two, which is something, you know, because the response to that is, well, we don't know at all either way. Um, but there are instances, say, for example, in Uganda, where we can look at Huawei's behaviour and say, yes, they have not just handed over data, they have actively hacked the phone of the opposition leader on behalf of President Museveni, like act, act proactively, you know, offered to do it and showed them how to do it. Um, this isn't this isn't guilt by association. This happened, um, and in that case, it didn't harm its commercial interests because President Museveni is giving them contract after contract, and and the general public is none the wiser because of media control. Wen Ting, so that's that's very long long winded. Wen Ting, um, very brief question to you. Are people in the financial side of things aware of the risks of China becoming a reserve currency? Because becoming a reserve currency is really not at all what it's cracked up to be. Very quick one for you there. Um, and you can absolutely agree with your point about CDB. Um, the Exim Bank comparison is fascinating for me because you have these cases. Tonga is always held up in the Pacific as the example of debt trap diplomacy. But if you look at China Exim Bank's behaviour, after um, CCECC, ironically, had gotten the Tongan government into all sorts of debt. 2013, they were approached by the Tongan government and the Chinese companies, you know, will you give us money for a port development? And China Exim Bank just laughed them out the door and said, look, look how far in debt you are. There's no way we're going to give you any money until you pay back what you already owe us. Um, and you have examples of Chinese companies telling me, I hate China Exim Bank, I would much, much rather get money from the ADB because they don't know what's going on. Whereas China Exim Bank will audit us every month and say, well, what have you spent the money on? Whereas ADB just lets them go and do what they want. Um, but they are possibly because of lack of, lack of Ren, um, lack of people on the ground, they are susceptible to back channeling by the Chinese companies. And they have been involved in um, troubled investments as a result. So does that happen with CDB? I guess it would be my short question. Sorry, too many questions there. Uh, <coughs> a quick question for Wen Ting. Um, hi, Wen Ting. I have a question on the currency swap uh, issue, uh, which you cited as a, as a positive example of renminbi internationalization. I've had to learn a little bit about currency swaps lately because um, Laos has a currency swap arrangement with China, which was provided in 2019. And it's, uh, it's come in handy uh, given the financial crisis in Laos that's happening at the moment in relation to to borrowing too much money from China. Um, but the interesting thing was that um, the currency swap, uh, it's a $900 million currency swap, which is quite significant for Laos, but there's a earmarking on that currency swap where Laos can only use that money to pay for Chinese imports. Um, so can you comment on that? Um, it'd be like, I understand that it's, this is not how currency swap arrangements would work between the US and Japan or Australia and Indonesia. Uh, can you comment on that and help me to understand this a bit better? I'll just briefly respond to Graham's point about the state-owned enterprises and the mergers. Um, I think um, it kind of the attention of the central government and SASAC goes in sort of waves, and so because they can't focus on all 
state-owned enterprises at the same time. So you get a period of maybe five or ten years even where they're not looking at you, and that's when the misbehavior, the diversions, the kind of um, fragmentation goes on. And then they come and have a look and say, oh, no, you've done all this bad stuff. We'd better merge you with another company. And this has happened in China as well. Um, so, but the mergers don't necessarily solve it because I quoted in my book some people from the headquarters of some of the uh, big power corporations in China saying, these companies were merged, but we can't control that other company that was merged with us, even though they're supposed to be a subsidiary because they still keep their own corporate culture, their own sort of people, their networks. And, and it's like, it's almost like you're a child telling your grandfather to do something. They're not going to listen to you. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It's just Sasak, I think, trying to put in some kind of control, but not necessarily following it right through. But uh, on the other hand, there is that sort of waves of control, and then just the attention goes away. Um, and, and that's what they take advantage of, I think. But the idea of doing longitudinal, longitudinal is a very good one, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for raising the case of the um, China Laos um, bilateral currencies swap agreement. That is a very good example to demonstrate like the China's ultimate goal is not the liberalization, not the currency liberalization, not the renminbi internationalization. They use the renminbi internationalization as a means for the state development goals, and also the state's goal of the social, economic, political stability, that is a priority. So that's, that's the reason why we see, like China, it seems like it would like to increase the use of RMB, but at the same time, it's served for the purpose for the development goals. It used the kind of the market distorture tools and in its economic strategy making. So it's quite different from the uh, assumptions of the Western macroeconomic bit. So that's, I think that's the reason why the, we have the, the West have the misunderstanding of the China's accession to the WTO. So we re remember in the early 2000s, the U.S. celebrated achievements of the China's accession to the WTO as a signal like China integrates the world market. We see the China economic liberalization, maybe it will associate with the political liberalization and whether the West really celebrate that. But actually, we see the, uh, the Trump administration commented as a disaster because the China used the liberalization as a tool for the state development goals. And we see it, that's the reason why we see like China actually don't have the strong commitment to liberalization at, for, um, at, at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no particular kind of re response because I appreciate all comments. I will look forward, I will further explore my cases. Just take advantage of this opportunity. I have also comment, question about Colin. We talk about, like you said, is like mm, maybe CCP has some limit to influence private enterprise. But what I f find so far is since the Xi Jinping, things are really changing. The before, party had um, exerted some influence over Guozhou Sasa or state institution, but now it's after Xi Jinping really directly influenced making, building more party inside. For example, party committee right now, they have decision making power. Guozhou is inferior. Like party committee has really huge influence on board of director. You may just ignore what Sasa require, ask, or whatever. So I think party is really building up inside. It doesn't really matter. And also it required, not just SOE, private enterprise, joint foreign investment company, it's required. You have to install party committee. So it's not real. It's not just suspicion or some kind of our guess. <laughs> so they have institutional structure. How can we expo uh, import, uh, influence political control? So I think that we have to be thinking about it. Uh, did you 
fast, fast. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just want to give short comment to Dr. Yo Yo Kyung. Um, I'm not sure whether it is an interesting argument in this that the way you portrayed CDB as a board regulator and investor uh, to protect Chinese asset abroad. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you, if we pin down all the energy projects that involve Chinese investor in Indonesia over the past 10 years. Actually, Chinese Exim Bank also play important role here. So perhaps you also can approach or do some analysis how actually CDB even either work hand in hand with this Chinese Exim Bank or um, whether they also have some sort of overlap interest or conflict of interest or even attack of war between them. Um, but actually talking about energy project in Indonesia, some successful project like Celukan Bawang, even though it's quite controversial, but like there are a lot of coal fire power plant, which is a lar large scale power plant in Indonesia, are financed both by CDB and Exim Bank. So it will be much more um, yeah, challenging, but also intriguing at the same time if we can see both um, of these policy bank roles in this coal fire power plant as well. Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. Um, um, just an, a, a question or, or a comment um, to, to Colin. Um, so I find that the, the, the model, uh, the theory of uh, fragmented and authoritarian quite useful, but really, you know, um, I'm curious if you can still apply that in the overseas context to examine the uh, relations between the SOEs and the, um, the so-called private enterprises. So, um, you know, my, my, uh, the w my observation may be like anecdotal, but like, for example, in Ethiopia, like, you know, it is normally like the central, the Zhongyang uh, they, they get their bid or the project from, you know, with the help of the embassy, and then they subtract it to the uh, private enterprises. And in some cases, they even demand the, uh, um, the, uh, the private companies to, 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 to how do you say that? I don't like to, to lend some money to them if they are short of money. So um, you can see that uh, the boundaries between the SOEs and private companies may not be that uh, clear cut. Mm -hmm. so, um, mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you can <laughs> maybe apply that model to the overseas Chinese operations here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Professor Yu Kyung. Um, you talk about the uh, Chinese investment bank take a very precaution, precaution uh, assessment before they embarking the projects. And you take two case studies, one, one um, that doesn't have, uh, I mean, the feasibility to continue, and the other one is a successful one. I was thinking, like, um, in the context uh, when the project has already been embarked, and then later on it discontinues due to the several issues, uh, where you also consider to uh, select for your case studies. Uh, a, a good example is in Cambodia, like a large uh, Chinese uh, sugar plantations in the northern part of the countries. They implemented like quite a few years, and then later on, the projects. Uh, I mean, any of tolls uh, evidence informed it that this uh, company stopped operating because of the bankrupt bankruptcy. But I guess maybe also it's really links to the issue of Cambodia receive what we call the uh, preferential uh, trade policy from the EU where Cambodia could actually export uh, sugar to the EU, and then later on there was a kind of political uh, issue, and then uh, there was a withdrawal of the EBA from 20% uh, 20, 20 withdrawal of the EBA from Cambodia, and then there's an issue of that uh, investment uh, coming in. Uh, yeah. And maybe perhaps a very uh, short question. <laughs> I'm not really sure the clear cut between private investment SOE, how much you distinguish between these two in terms of values, in terms of maybe employment, something like 
Yeah, thank you. Um, we have five minutes uh, for you to respond to those questions. Sorry for that, and uh, uh, maybe you can discuss maybe uh, offline later. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be as very quick, uh, although these are obviously complex questions. Uh, <coughs> in terms of the relationship between Chinese SOEs and private firms, they definitely work together, whether it's overseas or in China. But often that's part of those networks I was talking about where they're acting in their own interest, not necessarily in the Chinese government's interest. And I've heard that overseas that quite often it's the state-owned enterprises that actually initiate, try to initiate the projects in those countries. They might get some help from the embassy, but it's not necessarily the Chinese embassy that's pushing them into it. It's the other way around. And then the private enterprises, they subcontract to them because then they're more likely to get a profit out of it. So they actually depend on the private enterprises quite heavily. And, and they're sort of working in their own self-interested networks. There's, uh, as for the party committees within private corporations, I've looked at that in my book. Um, I didn't talk about that today, but because people have been saying, oh, Xi Jinping's pushing this in private corporations, more party organizations and things like that, <coughs> but they, they, they work in a very different way in the, in the private firms. And s first of all, in terms of the numbers, I, I looked at the party's uh, own statistics about Pr uh, party branches in private Chinese firms over the past, since about 2012 till about 2020. There was a slight <laughs> kind of increase in the numbers, but then it went down to before, the to below what it was in 2013 before Xi Jinping came into power. So there was about uh, a drop of about 400,000 in the total number of party organizations in Chinese private firms within the period from around 2016 to 2019. So it seems there was a bit of a push initially, but then because those party organizations in those firms don't really have a clear function and they don't really help the business to make money, <coughs> the private firms have basically let them, you know, almost languish without having a real influence. And the people who work in the private firms Communist Party branches are actually just employees of the firm uh, who happen to be Communist Party members. They're not specially hired in from outside or inserted by the government. So <coughs> what's happened is, and, and there's quite a few studies on this, there's a so-called <coughs> familiarization of the party branches within private Chinese firms so that often the party branch secretary of the private firm is a family member of the in the same family as the CEO, um, or <coughs> if, if they're not family members, they're just somebody who they, they get along very well with because they want to be able to control the party branches within their firms. So it hasn't resulted, uh, based on the empirical research which many s scholars have done, it hasn't resulted in more control by the party. In fact, it's the party branches tend to um, follow what the founders or the CEOs of the firm want. They've been kind of co-opted, which I found very surprising because of all this, you know, a lot of commentary about Xi Jinping trying to push the party branches. Uh, the state-owned enterprises are completely different because they have a party leading group, which is basically their party committee, but often they are overlapped with the executives of the firm. So they're completely different from the private firms. But I think that's been over-exaggerated that private firms are now somehow controlled more by the party branches. 